as we begin today's service, I invite you to review with me the first half of the Christian year. We have moved from Advent and the birth of Jesus to the season of Epiphany, a time of revelation and light. The season of Lent gave us an opportunity for reflection and self-assessment. Holy Week takes us to Good Friday, the most difficult day of the Christian year. Easter and the weeks that follow are a time of resurrection joy, walking with the risen Christ, and then with the ascension and the bestowing of the Spirit at Pentecost, we arrive here at today's service, the beginning of what is sometimes referred to as ordinary time, an in-between time that is neither Christmas nor Easter nor the seasons before or after. Truth be told, I'm ready for some ordinary time because the first half of the year is extra busy, at least from a worship planner's standpoint. Today then, I propose that we take a deep breath and move through our morning gathering with a sense of spaciousness, with an absence of hurry. That may well mean that today's service will run longer than the usual 36 to 43 minute services that I've been aiming for on YouTube. And you may even find there's points of the service that you want to stop it and pause and go deeper. The story of Isaiah's call, a scene of awe and wonder, will be our gentle guide into this time of reflection and praise. We begin with the hymn that led many of us into worship for decades. Holy, holy, holy. Good morning. 
In today's time of worship, we are reminded of the awe and wonder we experience in the presence of God. We pause for a moment to consider times and places of wonder in our lives. And we light this Christ candle, the flame carrying to us God's desire for life and light and love. Let us worship God. Amen. Take a deep breath now and release it. And bring to mind the way that you relate to the land that you are on. The way you relate to the rocks and the earth, to the rivers and lakes, to the foliage and trees, to the creatures that creep and scurry and leap, to the air we breathe and all living beings that fly through the sky. Consider these things with gratitude and envision how you fit into that diverse, amazing scene. For you, too, are part of God's glorious creation. Let us now expand that circle, pausing for a cleansing breath as we do. Imagining not just my relationship with this place, but our relationship with this place and with one another. While we seldom recite the names of the many indigenous peoples who have deep relationship with this land in our weekly time of territorial acknowledgement, let us take the time to do that now. Let us acknowledge and honor the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Jinnakee, and Bearspaw, the Blackfoot, Pekani, Siksika, Kainai, the Sutina, the Katunaha, and Sequepmuk, the Dene, the Mountain Cree, and the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. In naming these peoples one by one, we remember the promises of Treaty 7, the calls of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, our United Church apologies in 1986 and 1998, and our desire to walk a good road together with the indigenous peoples of this land. On this day we also specifically grieve the loss of over 200 souls at the former residential school in Kamloops, a stark reminder of those terrible realities. with one more deep cleansing breath. May this mindful recounting of our relationships with the land and all our relations hold and inform us in this time of awe and wonder. Hello. Uh, today's scripture reading is Isaiah 6, chapter verses 1 through 8. Um, Isaiah becomes a prophet. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a very high throne. His long robe filled the temple. Heavenly creatures of fire stood above him. Each creature had six wings. It used two wings to cover its face, two wings to cover its feet, and two wings for flying. Each creature was calling to the others, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, all powerful. His glory fills the whole earth. Their calling caused the frame around the door to shake as the temple filled with smoke. I said, oh no, I will be destroyed. I am not pure and I live among people who are not pure, but I've seen the King, the Lord all powerful. One of the heavenly creatures used a pair of tongs to take a hot coal from the altar. Then he flew to me with the hot coal in his hand. The creature touched my mouth with the hot coal and said, look, your guilt is taken away because this hot coal has touched your lips. Your sin is taken away. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, whom can I send? Who will go for us? So I said, here I am, send me. In line with the intention that was set earlier in today's service, I'd like to approach today's reading from Isaiah more from an emotional, a spiritual level than from an academic or intellectual viewpoint. As such, now would be a good time to get yourself sitting comfortably, perhaps looking outside through a window or being outside on a deck or balcony or public bench or lawn chair. And in that place, seek the intersections between this text and my words and your hopes and hesitations, your experience, your journey. In a time of national uncertainty, when there was a transition on their throne, a miraculous encounter opens before young Isaiah. If I could give this an appropriate visual, it might be a dry ice show at a big theatric rock concert, or out here, perhaps more appropriately, a day of heavy looming mist that gives the mountains of the Bow Valley an even more majestic look than usual. Isaiah describes the setting and the visual like so. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. A scene of awe and wonder. We note that Isaiah describes this not as a dream, but as being in the very presence of God. Anyone who has had such numinous moments remembers them as unique, life-changing, and pure gift, even if they are beyond explanation. We are right to be suspicious of those who make wild claims prefaced by God told me this or God showed me this, especially if the words or actions that they undertake are clearly contrary to the loving intention of God. Yet even with that disclaimer, I do not wish those false or misguided claims to make us uneasy about naming the moments when the divine does reach into our daily living and touches our very being. If you can identify a time or times of deep intimacy with the Holy, I invite you to bring that into your consciousness now. Or if that's not really the case for you, find a memory that 
places you amidst awe and wonder. Perhaps a mountain vista, a holy sight, a newborn child, a connection with the intricacy of creation. Find for yourself an experience where you have been taken aback by awe. Stay with that feeling of awe and wonder for a few moments. And as you do, let it lift up other related emotions. Praise, hopefulness, bewilderment, amazement, ecstasy. Whatever happens on an emotional level when your soul revisits awe, and wonder. These emotions that arise from awe and wonder lead us into the next section of Isaiah's religious experience. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What do we make of this place and these emotions? One of the natural responses to something majestic is the humility of realizing one's mortality and one's relative size. Being in the presence of the holy may also, as it did for Isaiah, take us deeper into a sense of guilt or shame, a sense of personal shortfall or an admission of one's participation in and benefit from unjust social schemes. In the midst of these kinds of feelings, guilt, shame, humility, culpability, it is important to recognize the constructive ability of these emotions to help us reset things that need resetting, without allowing them to crush our spirit or demean our selfhood. Life is not designed to be ruled by guilt and shame, and yet at times these are things that can call us to be honest about realities that we are well aware of and try to hide from. The healthy versions of guilt and shame in appropriate amounts can hold a mirror up to us and ask, is this how you want to be? Is it? Now if any of this speaks to your experience, and if you can do so safely, I invite you to sit with some of these difficult things that have arisen for a few moments. Think of, perhaps, times when you are not acting from your best self. Frustration or anger or guilt at living in a society where race and class and gender and gender identity and education and physical attributes and abilities all give automatic advantage to some and automatic disadvantage to others. Bring to mind sorrow at how easily convenience and personal desire become more important than attending to the needs of the planet. Spend some time in those places where Isaiah's expression of being a person of unclean lips living amidst a people of unclean lips 
rings true in your life and our life. I invite you to sit with that and again breathe into that. Fortunately, Isaiah does not get stuck or stranded in this difficult place, and God does not pile on further harsh realities. But rather, through these fiery creatures, God reaches out to Isaiah, as Isaiah describes here. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Clearly it is not God's desire that we spend our lives burdened by guilt or shame or embarrassment. And it is certainly not God's desire that anyone else should hold power to stunt your life by weaponizing these feelings against you. In this otherworldly, ecstatic religious experience described by Isaiah, God initiates the act of healing, a time of purification, cure, restoration, release. So for a moment I'm going to ask you to duck back into those hard places that you were just remembering. Places of shame or embarrassment or hopelessness. And in that place to realize God's intention to reach with healing love across that seeming chasm between you and your God. From that initial difficult or diminished place, God invites you to resolve. And God offers support to engage in life-affirming, loving change. As we again breathe into this process, we ask ourselves, what negative narratives need to change or just stop in your life to let you respond positively to this divine reach out? How might you seek and receive the support of God through prayer, through trusted friends, through self-affirmation, to step into the glorious fullness of life? How will you embrace from here forward what Mary Oliver described as your one wild and precious life? From that point of healing and hope, we move to the final stanza of Isaiah's vision. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. from a time of important self-realization and then God's healing invitation to new possibilities comes this opportunity for mission and Isaiah steps up and says yes. This culmination of an inward process with an action that turns to the world in a spirit of loving outreach reminds me of a poem by Lynn Unger 
which many of us encountered about a year ago. Lynn writes, Pandemic. What if you thought of it as the Jews considered the Sabbath the most sacred of times? Cease from travel. Cease from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those uh, to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful you could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. As we consider Isaiah's response to his call, to share God's healing love in many diverse ways as we consider Lynn Unger's beautiful words, as we consider the joys and challenges that will come with being more social again, as we imagine what re-engagement might look like personally, societally, even as a community of faith, and as we acknowledge other callings from God that may be totally independent of the strangeness of these pandemic impacted years 2020 and 2021. As we hold all of that, I invite you to hold, to uh, pay attention to the emotions that come to you as you imagine responding to God's callings whether those feelings are excitement or trepidation, relief or uncertainty, thankfulness or unsettledness, whatever arises. No matter what your response, let it connect you to the Holy One who reaches out to you in love so that you may be guided into the mysterious world of whatever comes next. Our time with the sixth chapter of Isaiah ends for now with one more deep breath and this prayer. for the emotional landscape of our lives and for the God experienced in the majesty of Creator, the humility of the Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is our companion and guide across all of life's terrains. We give our humble thanks and praise. Amen. The Ralph Connor Friday e-newsletter is in the midst of a series of four messages highlighting aspects of the anti-racism work being done by the United Church of Canada and its communities of faith. This week the focus is on unconscious bias. A link is included in that article to the work of Reverend Bill Miller of Winnipeg, our sabbatical minister here at Ralph Connor in 2019. Here, Bill speaks a few words of introduction.
Not realizing that having biases is part of the human condition, we gave it a moral value. We assumed that discriminatory thought and behavior was conscious and chosen. Good people, those who know better, do not act with bias. And those who don't know better, or are bad people, they're the ones who are biased. But that's not how it works. Bias works on the unconscious level, not the conscious. We can be blissfully unaware that it is busy working away in the background. As a national church, we are committed to a process of becoming anti-racist. And both Rundle and Ralph Connor, as affirming ministries, have made explicit commitments. And here I quote from Rundle's statement to full inclusion of people of any age, race, ethnicity, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, family structure, or personal circumstance in all aspects of our life together. All aspects. May an exploration and unveiling of the biases that block these intentions for inclusion be part of our work together. As an introduction to our prayers today, I'd like to reach back to the first verse of our reading from Isaiah, in which he says, in the year that King Uzziah died. It's always struck me as a strange way to introduce or, or to set in place this particular uh, awe-filled, wonderful vision. Why would the prophet Isaiah describe this ecstatic, ethereal experience with that kind of time marker. Isaiah lived through four Judean kings. Uzziah, who was well regarded but prone to vanity. His son Jotham, who was generally well regarded. Uzziah's grandson Ahaz, who was one of the real duds in the house of David, and Uzziah's great-grandson Hezekiah, uh, under whose leadership the political and 
uh, devotional fortunes of the nation improved. Put simply, it was a time of a lot of ups and downs. By remembering his experience with God within this political setting, I think that Isaiah is saying to his audience and us that God can and will call and equip people to deep commitment to peace, love, and justice, even when times are very, very unsettled. This to me is not just good news, it is phenomenally good news. Amidst that point of connection to these topsy-turvy days of 2021, let us now open ourselves to spend some time with that same God of peace, love, and justice. Friends, let us pray. O God of awe and wonder, we bless you for the broad vistas of life, in nature and within human experience. We thank you for things beyond our understanding, for your agenda of love that reaches well past our lifespan, for the expansiveness of life and a wish for spacious, expansive living, we give you thanks and praise. O God of wisdom, truth, and honesty, we name to you in silence some of our least proud moments. Temptations we find very hard to resist. Our participation in unjust ways that we are aware, well aware of, but neither change nor challenge. We bring to you that which seems broken, stuck, beyond any help. In our lives, in our nation, in this world. These things we bring in a spirit of confession. O God of reconciliation and hope and new beginnings, we are so grateful that your agenda is empowerment, not diminishment, emerging hope, not enduring guilt, accountability and apology and amends, not endless unproductive blame, denial or deflection. You reach beyond the chasms we create. You reach beyond these with forgiveness and fresh-born justice. Let us pause for a moment in the midst of your grace and let it soak in to cleanse and soothe and rebalance our lives and our relationships. O oh God who calls, Open our senses, our emotions, our intellect, our passions to the needs of this world that you call us, here and now, to engage. Reach past our well-rehearsed list of reasons why we are not up to the task and join us to your movement for life-changing love. Overcome our defeatist list of reasons. Sit with us as we reflect and name for us something that I can do, that we can do together as people of faith for the benefit of creation and all living beings. O God, whose love is our foundation and our purpose, our origin and our horizon, 
we bring you these prayers of our lives and join in the prayer given us by Jesus, saying, Our Mother and Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time of worship draws to a close with words of blessing, which come to us from Francis Weller, and which I first encountered this past Wednesday at Evensong. In the name of God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, may you be well. May you be safe and protected in all ways. May you be strong and healthy of body. May you be happy and peaceful of mind. May you sense holy, connective presence. May your life be a home for awe and wonder. May you tend life with graceful ease. Amen and Amen. I